Welcome back, everybody, to Empyreon Galactic Survival on Alpha 12.3. I am an old guy gaming, and this is the How to Get Started in Empyreon detailed tutorial series. Uh, so if you are seeing this video for the very first time, um, stop watching it and go watch episode one first, because uh, we covered a lot of very important uh, ground in episode one, and you, you, you want to get uh, through that stuff first before you continue with this. This is assuming, of course, you are a new player and you're trying to learn the game. All right, so we are going to pick up right where we left off. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the, in the first episode going through the menus and the toolbars and the different indicators and what those mean. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to we're going to continue uh, doing that for the first part of this episode. Then hopefully, you know, we'll get through all that and we'll still have enough time to go actually start doing some things here in the game. I hope you guys enjoy this um, video. If you do, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't take any effort and it will certainly help the channel. Uh, if you don't like what you see, please consider leaving me a constructive comment and help me to improve. All right, guys, let's get started here. So. Um, we're going to go back into our, our, our menu here by pressing, uh, in my case, the, uh, the tab key. And we talked about uh, the inventory. Um, we talked about the toolbar. We talked about the stats. There are a couple other things in the inventory that I do want to uh, cover. Notice up here, for example, it tells me what the date is um, and the time of day. So that's another and what day it is on the playthrough. So you can see that information up there. Um, anything that's in my inventory... If I hover over it, it'll show a, a tooltip. So basically it gives me information about that particular item. And that will, of course, change based upon whatever that item happens to be. One of the things that you should pay attention to if you're playing with weight and volume, which we are in this tutorial, is mass and volume of a particular item. Um, because, you know, there, there are limits on that like we talked about. Something that's new to Alpha 12 is this little sort option. Um, so this is kind of cool. So you can actually sort your items based upon either the type, um, either in ascending or descending order alphabetically. You can sort it, you know, based upon food, uh, perish time, which is a thing in the game. If you have, there's certain things in your inventory that will perish. For example, if I hover my cursor over my energy bars, notice there's a perish time of 80. Well, it's 81 now. So those will eventually spoil uh, if I don't eat them. Um, or you can sort based upon mass, how heavy stuff is, or volume, the quantity. I usually sort on item type. That seems to work for me. Um, but, you know, it, it's really up to you as, as to how you want to sort it. Um, the mass over here tells me what my current weight is, and the volume tells me, you know, what my current volume is. So both of these things are mutually exclusive. For example, um, if my volume gets all the way up to 500... Um, that's it. I can't put anything more in. Even if I still have uh, more weight left over, if I can carry more weight, I can't at that point carry more volume and then vice versa. If I, if I put something in my inventory, that's going to be too heavy. That's going to put me over the weight limit. The game will not let me do it without using the wireless uh, menu. Okay. Really important uh, stats there for that sort of thing. Now, uh, let's take a look over on the right-hand side. We looked at the stats. Let's let's click on this thing called Survival Instructor. This is really important for the very early game, and it's even useful later on, too. The Survival Constructor, you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit with this. But basically, um, inside your suit, even though we don't really have a suit on, well, at least we, I should say we don't have armor on, but inside your, your suit... Um, you have the ability to manufacture some really basic things, to, to construct some really basic things. So just kind of think of it as, you know, like a Star Trek replicator, a little mini pocket replicator, if you will. The things that I can make in here uh, are shown in this little grid. Um, and so I can make uh, uh, oxygen, I can make another detector if I needed to, I can make a tent, I can make a survival tool, etc., etc. Um, you still need resources to make these things. So anything that shows red means that I don't have the materials to make that. It'll tell you down below in the screen tip what you need to make this item. In this particular case, I need 10 plant fibers to make myself a new tent. So, you know, maybe uh, I might have accidentally lost this tent or left it behind in my last camp and I need to make another one, uh, for example. Okay? Um, the, there are the only two things in this menu that you can automatically make is the detector and the survival tool. Those two items do not require any ingredients to make. 
the game somehow or another magically just makes those things for you. <laughs> and, you know, that's okay because, remember, this is a survival game, and any survival game you play, I don't care what game it is, at some point, you've you've got to have something to start with, and, and those are your two somethings to start with. The most important of the two by far, of course, is the survival tool, which we will talk about in detail here in a little while. All that to say, this is where you can make some very basic things in the early game. And so you just need to make sure that you have whatever item this particular um, item requires, I'm sorry, whatever ingredient or resource that this item requires in your inventory uh, in order to make it. And it tells you right down, down there what you need. We'll talk a little bit more about how to use it and what you should start with and that sort of thing in a little while. Right now, uh, I just want to make sure we get through all the menus and familiarize everybody with the menus. So you can switch back and forth between your survival constructor and your stats tab as needed. Anything that you make in the survival constructor will um, will end up in these two output slots, okay? Um, and then they will stay in there until you move them out. But once you move something out of these slots, you, can, you can't put them back in. So just kind of keep that in mind in terms of inventory management. Oh, look at this. It is... Um, 11 minutes, in-game minutes until sunset. 10 minutes now. I can tell that because I can look in my upper right-hand corner by my mini-map. You know, now it's 9 minutes, now it's 8 minutes, etc., etc. One thing to know about Empyrean, and this is really cool, and this the game's been this way for a long time, is that if I look at the planet, and I'll, I'll talk about the menus here in, in, in a moment. Don't fixate on that yet. Just look at what I'm showing you. If I look at the planet... You can actually see the um, the Terminator here. The Terminator is what, what you call, you know, the place where light meets dark, basically, on a planet. And it does, in fact, move with the rotation of the sun and the rotation of the planet around the sun itself, right? So if I immediately went to the west, or I'm sorry, to the east, I would, I would get into nighttime. Uh, whereas if I immediately went to the west, I would get back into daytime. So I would essentially go almost go, go back in time is, is the effect of that. So that's kind of cool about Empyrean, and, and it's something that's important to know. So day and night is not global. It is based upon where you are at on the planet that you happen to be on, or the moon, or whatever uh, that you happen to be on. And uh, so that's important to remember. Uh, if you you know want to be out at night or you don't want to be out at night or you want to be out in the daytime and so forth Okay, so it is now nighttime One way I can tell that is other than the fact that it got dark is that I can now hear the crickets chirping Apparently we have crickets on this planet uh, And if I look in the upper right hand corner uh, next to my mini map, I can now see that it's 11 uh, 11 hours and 28 minutes before the Sun will rise again uh, in this particular spot, but remember uh, let's just look at this for a second. If, if I just head west, watch the time in my upper right-hand corner. You know, right now it says 11.24 under crash site. If I start heading west and, and running west, you see how that time is starting to go back up again instead of going down? That's because I'm actually heading west and moving more towards the sun. If I was in a fast vessel, small vessel or hovercraft, I could actually get all the way back into the daylight um, and essentially outpace the sun. Okay. So all that to just, you know, just so you understand how, how day and night works on the planet. Because I'm in the crash site biome and also on the, the starter temperate planet, I don't really need to worry too much in this area about anything dangerous. But if I get out of this crash site uh, at nighttime, um, there, there are creatures that will come out that will want to eat me for dinner. Um, the game has, uh, for example, raptors in it, uh, like actual dinosaur raptors in it. And they are mean sons of bitches, and they will, they'll try and eat you. Uh, so you have to really be careful ab about those in the early game. And they're fast, and they run in packs, as you can imagine. And then, you know, there's other things. There's giant spiders that will come out and want to eat you. And depending upon the planet you're on, there could be even worse things. So, uh, you know, really important to, to just keep that stuff in mind when you're new to the game and you're, you're trying to, you know, figure out how to play it. So here's the cool thing. Uh, because it is now nighttime, if I want to instantly get back to the morning... I can either sleep in the escape pod, and notice if I put my cursor on it, it says press left shift plus F to sleep. Um, or if I'm not near my escape pod, I just plop my handy dandy little tent down here. So let's just get away from the escape pod and plop it down. And again, same thing, press left shift to pick up. Now, before we do that, uh, when you start the game, I think when you start the game on easy mode, I think it gives you a light. I might be wrong about that, though, actually. Uh, it did not give us a light 
uh, here on the medium settings, on the medium difficulty settings. Um, you can make yourself a light in the portable constructor, which we will talk about here in just a little bit. Um, but as of right now, I have no source of light. So I'm pretty much at the mercy of whatever the light on the planet happens to be. Now we do have some, the moon is starting to rise, so we'll have some moonlight. Uh, but for a little while there, it was pretty damn dark. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. But here's the thing. If I don't have any reason to be out at night, if I don't want raptors to eat me when, you know, and, and that sort of thing, or if I've queued up a bunch of stuff and I just want to kind of fast forward and get that, you know, that stuff done that we talked about in the first episode, then I just hold down the shift key. I press, um, wait a minute. Uh, I'm sorry. Just hit F. Yeah. Sh left shift plus F pick things up. We just want to hit F. Then the screen goes black for a couple of moments and boom, it's daytime. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, so we survived the night. But I don't know if you noticed this or not, but you know, I, I lost a little bit of food and I would have lost a little bit of oxygen if we were on a planet where we had, you know, w where we needed assistance breathing. So time does in fact go by, even though it was instantaneous or nearly instantaneous for us, it still had an effect on us. So, so very important that you always take that into account. Here's a little tip for you. The tent has, it's two purposes are to set a spawn point for you. So if I go out and get killed now, uh, I can respawn at the tent and it allows you to sleep uh, through the night. Side note, can't do it on multiplayer server for what should be obvious reasons. So this is only a single player uh, thing that you can do. Um, and as far as I know, it's not like Minecraft, where is if everybody climbs in bed, then you can all sleep. Uh, I don't think it works that way in this game. So this is only a single player thing to sleep at night. Uh, but it does say your spawn point. Here's, a, here's another s secondary purpose for the tent. Let's say that I want to <clears throat> uh, do a little bit of, of building and I want to clear all this grass. It is also a lawnmower. See, check that out. I can use it to... Cut the grass and clear all the grass out of the out of the area to build stuff. Now, when you set down a building core, we'll cover that later. Don't worry about it too much now. That's also going to clear a certain area. But in some cases, you know, you you might want to just clear a little bit of, of an area out in front of your your base or something like that. So you can also use this as a lawnmower. Pretty cool, huh? Um, I don't think I don't think that Alien necessarily intended you to use it that way, but it does work, and there's no harm in doing it. Okay, so um, you notice that a little screen tip popped up, and that's because I got close enough to a POI uh, where it, it, it my my suit's you know kind of passive scanner, I suppose you would call it, uh, detected uh, a device, and in this case, it's wreckage. And we can go over there later and see if there's anything we can salvage or loot from it. Let's finish uh, going through the menus before before we get into the action here. Okay, so across the top, you've got a lot of important things here across the top. The um, the first thing is your player, so that you know that's what we're on now. So it shows me the information about my player, which we've already gone through. Uh, the second button, which is currently grayed out, is the wireless menu. So that's this wireless thing I have talked about here. When I get within range of uh, a base or a vessel um, that has has the wireless capability. Um, then this will light up and then I can go into it. And it basically what it does is it gives me a menu that allows me to transfer stuff from my inventory to the device or even between uh, two different uh, containers between the wireless devices or the base itself. An example of that, let's say that I have a pretty large base and let's say that I uh, dropped off a bunch of ore in a, a drop-off container by the front door, um, but my actual processor... Uh, my my furnace uh, that smelts or or my my constructor is way back at the other end of the base and it's you know 100 blocks away um, what i can do is i can go over to the constructor um, and then i can open up the wireless menu and i can wirelessly transfer all of the contents from the drop-off container in the front of the building to the back of the building where i do my smelting um, so you know that's just basically that's what it is uh, and how that works um, the next button is our tech tree. So this game uh, has a leveling system, and once you hit um, every third level, um, well, no, I guess it's it, it depends. So from for it goes one to three, and then three to five, five to seven, seven to ten, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, once you hit those levels, then you can unlock different uh, technologies in the game. Very important uh, that you do that. And so a couple things to know about the the tech tree here. First of all. 
you have several tabs across the top. So these are all the items that I would need to learn to make base components, pay, components for uh, for my base. Okay, so built for for buildings and that sort of thing. Um, we won't get into exactly what all this stuff is right now. I just want you to get the overall idea. These are all the components that I would need to build a capital vessel. Okay, um, all the components I would need to build a small vessel, a hover vessel. The miscellaneous tab contains miscellaneous items that you know aren't necessarily specific to a small vessel or a capital vessel or a base, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the tools tab are various tools in the game. Your multi-tool, which we'll cover later. Your drill. Um, I can make another ore scanner if I happen to lose them when I have some lights, that sort of thing. And then the weapons. So these are all handheld weapons, not weapons like turrets and stuff that you would put on a ship, but handheld weapons uh, that I can learn at various levels. And of course, you know, these are going to be the more powerful weapons later on as I, as I level up. Okay. Now this is really important uh, to pay attention to. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, which tab I'm on. Let's just go to the back to the base tab for a minute. Um, it tells me, first of all, how many points I need to unlock this. So I need four points to unlock this fuel tank, this tier one uh, fuel tank. Uh, because it tells me that in the upper left hand corner when i get to level 10 then i would need 12 points to unlock the tier 2 and then of course when i get to level 15 i would need 20. Um, as you level though the game gives you uh you know exponentially gives you more and more points so you generally uh can learn i think now don't quote me on this so that those those of you guys who are watching that know this for a fact um i think you you can learn everything eventually once you get all the way to the max level but i might not be 100% correct about that, but I think that you can uh, eventually learn everything. So yeah, let me know if, if that is not correct in the comments. Um, so yeah, now here's here's the important thing that I wanted to show you though. Notice that to the left of this object, uh, this item, there's a bunch of color colored squares. Okay, what that's telling me is it tells me which types of constructors can make that item. In some cases, like for example, our tier three fuel tank, the only thing that can make that is the advanced constructor. How do I know that? Because I only see one little red square. Uh, and if I look down at the legend here, it tells me, oh, that requires an advanced constructor to make that. So, so you'll see that some of your higher end gear here, equipment um, can only be made like a furnace, for example, or a, a tier four CPU extender or a tech 2 large generator all that stuff can only be made in the advanced constructor Okay, really important to pay attention to that because you know, this happens to me sometimes too. It's like, okay I want to go ahead and make an assault rifle um, And so I go to make the assault rifle only to realize that I can't make it in you know, my portable constructor Or can you now? I don't think you can Yeah, see so the assault rifle it doesn't have a little pink square so I can't make my assault rifle in my survival constructor um, and so why that's important other than the obvious is this let's say that I have some points to spend and go oh cool I want to get an assault rifle but let's say that I don't have a portable constructor built yet I you can make one and you know that's not the point the point is that I might take this point thinking that I'm gonna get this and then realize oh shit I don't have the right constructor to make that. So now I just spent those points on something that I can't do here and now where I could have potentially spent them on something that I could, you know, make here and now. So just pay attention to that, uh, especially when you start getting up into the middle and higher tier stuff. You, you, you know, there are restrictions on what can make what. And, and it's pretty self-explanatory. You can just see all this down here. What are the constructors? Well, we talked about the survival constructor already, and we're going to use that in a little bit. That's, the, that's your little pocket constructor that's built into your suit. Portable constructor. This is something we're going to make. Just think of these basically as tiers. So the portable constructor is capable of making more things than the survival constructor can make. Um, but it is a device that I have to actually set down. These two constructors uh, run on their own power. I guess we have to figure out, you know, assume that they have some kind of like little micro nuclear power source or something in them. Uh, so they don't require power, but they're very limited as to what you can make. Um, the small constructor. The small constructor can make more things than the portable, but it requires power and therefore it requires a base. So you can't make and use a small constructor until you have a base made first. SV constructor. This is a constructor that basically um, is kind of similar to it's kind of similar to the small constructor in terms of what it can make, 
but it only works on a small vessel. Okay, uh, so you can put SV constructors on small vessels in particular. So that's a special type of constructor. And then, of course, a large constructor uh, works on both your base and a capital vessel. And it makes more, you know, than the small constructor. And then the advanced makes more than the large. So, so everything, for the most part, with a couple of exceptions, everything is backwards compatible. So anything that a large constructor can make, an advanced constructor can also make plus more. Okay, there, there, I think there are one or two exceptions to that, but let's not get into those weeds right now. That is pretty much it. So once I get some levels, I just simply click on whatever I want, and I, I can either click unlock or just double click on uh, the item and that will unlock it for me. Okay, let's take a look at this. This is our factions menu. There are NPC factions, there's human factions, and then there are neutral factions. These two don't really matter on, in a single player game. This is more multiplayer uh, PVP types of things. But if I'm on a multiplayer server, and I do have a multiplayer server, uh, by the way, uh, where I play uh, once or twice a week with, with uh, uh, members of my Discord community, uh, side note there. Anyway, um, so this is basically like your tribes in Ark or your guilds in World of Warcraft uh, in Imperion, they're called factions, right? So I can create a new faction name it whatever I want, and then I can invite uh, other people, or rather other people can apply uh, with this button to uh, my faction if they want to be in, you know, in my group. Um, completely doesn't matter at all in single player. It's only multiplayer types of things. Okay. Um, the, uh, and the same thing, you know, for, I, I believe the, the neutral faction is that, that way too. I'm not, you know, I'm not actually real familiar with what this is used for. I think it might have something to do with with story mode uh, types of things or um, uh, like scenarios and that sort of thing. I, I'm not really that familiar with, with that, to be honest with you. So, you know, if you guys are watching and you know exactly what this is used for, feel free to let us know in the comments. NPC faction. This one you do want to pay attention to, whether you're playing single player or multiplayer. These are the game's um, AI factions. The Xerax Empire. The Xerax Empire... Uh, they are generally the bad guys. They don't have to be. You can actually befriend them, but by default at the start, they are they're the bad guys. Okay. Um, so in in most cases, or in in the usual case, I should say, they're going to be your enemy, um, and they're going to attack you. Um, and you're going to attack them and they're going to try and take your base over. You're going to try and take their bases over or their POIs over. And, you know, they're really the bad guys. They're the guys that you go to war with in a single player game. Okay. Remember though, you can, if you want to play a little bit differently, you can actually get on their good side. And then basically you become a bad guy and go to war with everybody else. Uh, it's just a different way to play the game. I do not advise that when you're first learning the game though, because there's some, there's some pretty major consequences or drawbacks to doing that it is doable though and it can be fun for now all you need to know is the xerax are the bad guys okay the talon are a neutral uh faction uh they're kind of like the natives on the planet they are uh, i'm just that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> there's story mode stuff related to this that i don't want to spoil for new players so all you need to know for now is that the talon are the natives and you start out neutral to them in fact, you start out neutral with every other faction except for the Xerax. Now, um, you can then do certain things in the game to either raise your reputation or lower your reputation with these factions. If you look at uh, the screen on the right-hand side, it tells you what, um, what, what, what actions you can do to either raise or to lower the rep. Okay. So I'm not going to read through all of that stuff. I'll let you do that in your own game, but do pay very close attention to it. Here's one real common example. If I am neutral with the Talon and I, and I get on their territory, and the map will tell you if you enter their territory, and you can also see it, uh, in the case of the Talon, they kind of like use a green, a green color. And then I go mine a resource, like uh, let's say I find an iron deposit and I mine it on their territory. That's going to piss them off. I'm going to lose rep with the Talon if I do that because I'm some stranger. They don't know me. I haven't developed any kind of relationship with them. And here I am jacking uh, the, the ore off of their land, right? So it makes sense. And that holds true for, uh, for, you know, for the other factions too, right? So if I drop to unfriendly with a faction, then... 
you know, we, we're kind of like on the verge of war. In the case of the Xerax, if the Xerax are unfriendly to you, they they won't come after you, but they will shoot you on sight. So if I happen to get within range of a Xerax POI, um, a Xerax structure, or in range of a Xerax drone, and I'm unfriendly, they're going to shoot at me, okay? But what they're not going to do is they're not going to send troops to my base and try and take it over if I'm unfriendly, okay? However, if this drops to hostile, which is the next level down, then that's when they're going to start trying to attack my base and take it over okay L we'll talk about that later i don't want to get into to that right now all you need to know is that uh, all i want you to know right now is how the rep works okay um talon it, uh, so they're the natives that we talked about they're somewhat useful to you if you be if you become uh you know to trade with them and incidentally it used to be up until just the last uh, 12.2 release, you you used to have to get to friendly with these factions before you could trade with them. They just now changed that in, in 12.2, a couple of, uh, about three or four weeks ago, uh, to where you can now trade with them um, at neutral. And that's a brand new thing. It used to be you had to get to friendly with them. And that's a good change because, you know, it didn't make much sense that these factions wouldn't trade with a neutral person. Why wouldn't you, right? Um, so now, now you can actually trade with them at neutral. So that's new. Um, so th where the talent is going to be mostly useful to you is when it comes to crops. So one of the things that you're going to do in this game, uh, fairly early on is you're going to start growing your own crops, you know, to, to raise food and medical supplies and that sort of thing. And so you can go to the talent and, and get all of the seedlings that you need to start those crops. You can make them yourself, but depending upon, you know, what it is you're trying to do, sometimes it can be difficult or even impossible to find those things in, in nature or in the wild, depending upon the planet that you're on. So they're, they're really inexpensive. So just go to the talent and buy what you need uh, to get your farm started. They have some other supplies too, but, but I mostly, when it comes to commerce anyways, I mostly just use the talent to, to buy seedlings. Um, if you piss them off, if you get to uh, unfriendly and you then, you know, get in their territory, I believe they will fire on you. And if you get to hostile with them, they, just like the Xerax, will attempt to attack your base. And they've got um, they've got a, 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 a character called a Shaman, uh, that, and he's actually able to use some kind of Hocus Pocus to, to actually shut down the power in your base, um, which means then that your guns aren't going to work and stuff like that. So, you know, don't don't take them for granted. Um, but you can, of course, combat them if, you, if, are, if you're well equipped. And likewise with Xerax. Polaris. Polaris is kind of like your um, capitalists in the game. And they're the most important faction um, that you want to use for, for trading. Because uh, they're going to have the most stuff. And so trading in this game is, is I, I call it situationally or semi-useful. Um, uh, Elyon needs to do more work on the economy in this game, and I and I hope that they will at some point. Um, it is useful, but it's not it's not a real big part of the game yet. Um, like for example, if you <clears throat> excuse me, if you played um, if you've ever played Eve Online, the economy in Eve Online is super super important, and it's a huge huge part of how that game works. In Imperia, not so much. I'm not saying it's not useful. I'm just saying it needs to be more fleshed out at this point in time. Nevertheless, the Polaris are going to be super useful to you because they're going to have some things in the early to mid game that you might need that you can't necessarily easily get yourself. Um, and you can also, <coughs> excuse me, you know, at some point you're going to start looting uh, a bunch of POIs and getting a bunch of, of loot and stuff. And so you can actually sell that stuff to the Polaris and make money and get your own credits. Credits are important because you can buy stuff with them, duh, but uh, they introduced here with Alpha 12 the uh, a thing called station services now. Um, and so you can spend money to have a station, um, refuel your ship, repair your ship, rearm your ship, those sorts of things. So it's really actually a, a nice uh, mechanic. It's, it's super useful, and it gives us another incentive to make some bank uh, in the game. So it's a step in the right direction for the economy. So Polaris are, are your go-to guys uh, for, for that sort of thing. You generally do not want to piss them off uh, unless you are intending to do, like, say, a Xerax playthrough, okay? Um, and like anything else, if you know, if you make them mad, um, they will start firing on you. I don't know if the Polaris will actually 
attack you directly. I don't think that they do, but they will certainly fire on you if you get within their territory if you piss them off. So don't do it unless you want to. Pirates, Creel, and Traitors. These are all new factions with Alpha 12. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you, you're still neutral with the pirates, but it wouldn't take much to piss them off. They are, you know, I don't know that much about them. I haven't really done much with them uh, as of yet, but they also, you know, you can trade with them too. So, you know, you could potentially, if you wanted to do a a, a, a dark, um, a uh, what what the hell do they call it in role playing? Uh, dark aligned, you know, or if you wanted to be a bad guy playthrough, <laughs> to put it more simply, uh, and, you know, be in tight with the Xerax and the pirates, you could do that. And then your pirates kind of become like the Polaris would otherwise be where you can trade with them. However, I don't believe they have the same resources uh, that the Polaris hats but they still you know you still would have an option to trade with them and you can do some training with the xerax too um but not not on the same level i i don't think as the polaris the creole empire is is a, another new uh faction they're alien empires and then there's the trader guild i don't really know a whole lot about these i have not really experienced them myself yet um so i can't speak to a whole lot about you know pros and cons uh, with these guys i i think the traders guild is uh, i think they have like ships you know that fly around in orbit and you can you know they're like trading ships and you can go up to them and and trade with them and that sort of thing but uh i like i said i just don't know enough about these to to speak to them uh with any with any you know details so uh, but just know that they're new factions and the mechanic itself still applies to them too in terms of you know rep okay that was a lot of stuff but very important let's go on this is your what you're called your pda this is important for missions and for information about the game. So remember when we uh, first landed in episode one, it gave us the option to, uh, if we wanted to start the tutorial, and I said, no, I don't want to do that. Well, I can come back here and start the tutorial from here by just clicking this and then activating it, and then it'll start. Um, so let's just do that for a second just to see what happens. Okay, so I don't know if you guys remember this, but this popped up when we first landed. Um, and now if I want to, I can activate the tutorial and then what it's going to do is it's going to start walking me through uh, the beginnings of the storyline and a very basic tutorial to kind of help me get started. Um, so I, I'm not going to really get into this. It, notice it says you can uh, show the text immediately by just clicking the button uh, or advance to the next page or you can escape out of it by hitting escape. Okay, I'm not going to go any further than that other than to show you that's how you activate uh, from your PDA. Um, okay, so a couple of things to know about the PDA. When, especially when you're doing tutorials, stuff will pop up on the screen, and many times it'll pop up so fast that you don't have a chance to read it. And so you can come into your PDA and go to the log, and the log will, will basically show you what, was, what they just told you on the screen, okay? Um, so if you ever see something pop up and it goes away too fast and you're going, damn it, Elian, keep that shit up there longer so I can read it, well, you can't. You just go back into your PDA, hit the PDA log tab, and then you can see what it was that they told you. Especially important for questing because that's when you see a lot of those messages pop up. Uh, the PDA info tab then just gives you more information about whatever it is that you've clicked on over here. Now, one of the things you can do in this game, which kind of sucks, but sometimes it's necessary, is you can manually advance each one of these uh, quests. And sometimes the quest will, will bug out on you and you have no choice but to manually advance it. In which case you click the, you know, the item and then um, there's an, there should be an option for you to advance it. Now I don't know why that's not showing up for me. Usually what happens though is, is there will be a thing here and then you click something over here and then it'll say are you sure you want to advance this part of the quest and then you say yes or no i'm not sure guys why that's not showing up right at the moment but just know that you can do that so uh so that's the tutorial missions now you have solo missions so the tutorial here's what's kind of cool about this too all of these missions are kind of tied in with each other and they never used to be so if you start off on the tutorial mission um, and go through these, it will then direct you to start with the solo mission. And then you'll start the solo missions, excuse me, which go through the actual storyline of the game. And it's pretty interesting, you know, uh, to do this, 
But then, but you know, after a certain point, then it'll actually send you over and start you with the talent. And you'll go through the talent a couple times, and then it'll send you over to do some stuff for the Polaris and 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 that and back and forth. So it's kind of neat how all those uh, tie in. Xerax missions are not, to my knowledge, tied in with all of these. These are kind of just standalone. But you would do these missions if you wanted to actually get in good with the Xerax and be everybody else's enemy. So again, I'm not going to go through and talk much more about what the missions are because I don't want to spoil anything for you guys as far as the story goes. But if you're a first time player in Imperion, I do highly recommend that you go through these missions because you're going to get fat loots. You're going to learn about the story, learn about the game, and it's, it's definitely worth doing. The last tab I want to show you is the Imperiopedia. This is kind of like your manual. And so here you have the, like the 10 tips for getting started um information and you can click on that and then click on the header of this chapter to get tips started so i click back on the header and then it gives me just a bunch of tips to know all the stuff you know that i'm covering with you here in the tutorial so we don't need to read through it but just know that it's there if you want to refer to it later uh so tips for getting started you got doctor's journal um so there's all kinds of nasty shit that'll happen to you in this game hypothermia for example um can happen to you and it basically tells you all about this um, so it, it's basically says um, there, there aren't any medical items or stations that will directly fix this. What you have to do is you have to get you have to warm up <laughs> and here's how you can do it by sleeping, taking a shower, going inside a power base um, or using the air conditioner, that sort of thing. Um, or there's certain consumables that will raise your body temperature. These are the side effects, though, that will happen with this particular um, uh, ailment. Right. Um, so the, this is all just, you know, information about uh, what's here. And it's kind of weird how they have this set up. These kind of look like things you click on, but actually these are just the, the the headings. So medical items here, medical stations here, other cures down here. So this is really the area that you want to pay attention to. So you got frostbite, you got food poisoning. I mean, there's all kinds of nasty things that can happen to you in this game. And trust me, you guys, when this happens, you want to deal with it as soon as possible because what will happen is uh, these things will will advance if you let them go they'll get worse and worse until almost in every case you will eventually die um some things you know like hangover will wear off on itself uh, or rather by itself but a lot of these things will not and they'll just get worse and worse until it kills you so you know, don't mess around with that stuff uh biologist guide this is this basically gives you information about the various different um, plants and you know creatures and that sort of thing um no actually if this is biologist it's just going to be plants um, that you can come across with. Now, Elion did something two or three alphas ago, which I didn't really like. I understood why they did it, um, but I didn't really appreciate it. And what basically the game used to have specific plants for specific things. Um, and so fruit, for example, we used to have these things called space oranges or, or pears and that sort of thing, space pears or whatever the hell they were called. And so certain recipes... And when I say recipe, I either mean, you know, food, items, dishes, or medical required specific um, types of items. Like you need space oranges to make this particular dish, whatever it was. Um, they kind of dumbed that down and they, they, they generalized things. So now instead of having space oranges and pears, we just have fruit, right? Now, instead of having corn and, and uh, wheat, we just have grain, right? Now, instead of having... Um, Where's the uh, the plant proteins? Uh, these used to be called corn dogs or vegetables. That's what I was looking for. We used to actually have tomatoes, and we used to actually have pumpkins, and we used to actually have peppers, that sort of thing. Um, but now they're all just called vegetables. And so they kind of dumbed it down. They made it a lot easier. I don't like that. I like the way it was because it was more immersive. It was more true to actual survival. But, you know, it's a minor thing in comparison to the game as a whole. And, you know, I like other people, I just got used to it, and now that's just the way that it is. All that to say, pay really close attention to, to these things when you're brand new, because you, you can find out a lot of good information here in the Imperiapedia. Uh, you know, so this, this tells you about space drones and vessels and planetary drones and information. Really, really good. It's definitely worth your while to read through this. But I'm doing the tutorial for you guys, so we don't need... Uh, to read through this right here now. Just know that it's there and definitely take a look at it. All right, guys, that is it for that. Um, this is your blueprint shop. 
Man, this has taken a hell of a long time to go through all this stuff. I hope you guys are finding this useful. I know it's super detailed, but it's, it's intended to be super detailed. Um, so I don't think... See, we, we're out of time. Yeah, you know what? We're going to have to talk about all this other stuff in the next episode. Sorry about that, guys, but it's just, you know, I don't want these these episodes to get too too terribly long. So we're going to just pick up right where we left off in the next episode. It is nighttime. Um, and so we know now that if we have our tent uh, or if we're by our pod, we can just press F and sleep un uh, until morning. Actually, with the pod, it has to be shift F. So that's pretty cool. But anyway, um... That's it for this episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed. We will pick up right where we left off in the next episode. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, share out the video, and we'll see you in the next tutorial. Bye-bye.